So, I'm going to attempt something today that I've never attempted before. You can hear me okay at the back there, right? Okay. Part of the reason for this is my own uh, abbot, my own upajaya, and he's the one who gave me ordination. He's now around 86, very lively, uh, and he's a, a real meditation master. And when I went to ordain in his temple, I didn't speak Thai. And so I said to him, you know, when you're giving these talks, which would sometimes go on for like an hour or two hours, I said, you know, I can't understand what you're saying because it's in Thai. He speaks fluent English, fairly fluent English. Uh, I said, I can't understand what you're saying, so uh, maybe I just go back to my room while you give the talk. And he said, no, you have to stay. And I thought that was very unreasonable uh, at the time. <laughs> But actually, the truth is, you, you often get more out of a Dharma talk, even if you can't understand it. I don't know if you've uh, come across this. Sometimes put on a Dharma talk from uh, Ajahn Chah. There's plenty on YouTube in Thai, in Northeast Thai. So even Thais complain that they can't understand him. Uh, but it can actually be very nice just to stop yourself and know that this is Dharma. Just the sound of the Dharma and the flavor of the Dharma. By the way, that's what this uh, fan was for, uh, which just now I was covering my face with this. This is called a Dalabat. <clears throat> and the idea of a Dalabat is it hides your face. So when we, even when we do talks, we're supposed to hide our face with this. <clears throat> People find it a little strange, so we don't do it so much these days. Uh, back in the day, they would make these out of uh, sugar cane palm, sugar palm. So the actual word dan uh, comes from the palm tree, don dan. And so dan and a bat means like a stick. So the sugar palm stick, when you put these two words together in Thai, you get dalabat. And the idea is that you hide the face, the Dharma should be self-evident by itself and not dependent upon the person who's speaking it. So that's why they would always hide their face. And so I would go and listen to these talks by my abbot and quite soon, I, I mean, I knew the teachings, basic teachings of Buddhism. And then I realized that he was running through all of these basic teachings of Buddhism every, every time. And very often they would be very formulaic. So I felt like he's just trotting out the formulas, he's not really talking. But after a while I really started to appreciate that he was consistently and regularly putting all of these different teachings in Buddhism into place with each other. So it occurred to me that maybe many people or many of you have come and heard talks and heard the four of this, the six of that, the twelve of something else, um, but have never really placed it, put all of these teachings in their places with each other. So I'm going to attempt something a little strange today <laughs> in the history of Dharma talks. I'm going to run through all of the key teachings one, I'm going to rattle them off, one after the other. So, uh, some of you with pens and pencils, I wouldn't even bother trying to keep up writing it down. All of these particular teachings, you, you know, there's plenty of stuff around that you can uh, do each particular teaching in itself, uh, hundreds of great talks. The idea today is just to put it all together, put this jigsaw puzzle together so you can see uh, all of these little bits and pieces of Buddhism that you will have heard or picked up from around the place where it fits into the overall picture. Some of the points may be a little controversial or a little surprising, uh, but nonetheless, I'm going to 
rattled straight on through them. So the first key part of the teaching is this word amata. Amata means deathless. And the deathless was what the Buddha was seeking before he became enlightened. He had heard about some aspect of your being that uh, does not arise, <clears throat> does not change, and does not die. You may consider it like an essence with inside you. But for those people who attain to it, they always describe this essence as the bigger picture and that you are the little spark that's come up and will disappear. So the Buddha went in search of this amata and uh, he tried the Brahmana, Brahmin system of reciting Vedas and learning the cosmology, probably for around 12 years. And then he went back to his wife and uh, he had a baby and his baby he called a fetter. Fancy naming your child fetter, like ball and chain. Right? Uh, realizing that this was going to be something that keeps him in the world and keeps him from this attainment. So he then tried the other religious tradition in India at the time, which was the Samana tradition, which probably, it's very hazy, probably goes back to the Indus Valley civilization. And there the people would emulate animals in the hope of gaining the power of that animal. So they might walk around on all fours like a dog to get the dog power. They uh, might eat only raw leaves like a bull to gain the strength of a bull. <coughs> Uh, the civilization was well known for its sewage pipes, which are still in existence today. And the sewage pipes from the Indus Valley civilization are the same as the ones on Crete, where you had the story of the Minotaur. Again, this half bull, half man figure. So it seems the Samana tradition had begun with this idea that if you do an ascetic practice, you gain a power of some kind. And this is still very much the idea in India today. If you do a renunciation or a self-mortification practice, you will earn spiritual credits and you will become powerful. When you use your power, you, you use up those credits and you start to lose your powers. So you've seen the, in the various Hindu texts a lot of these... Uh, ideas. So after uh, leaving the home, he tried the Samana tradition, which is where the robes and the shaved head comes from, and found that that also did not get him to the Amata, the deathless. That was when the Buddha, uh, or the prince, took milk rice from, uh, some, from Sujata, not our Sujata, and the official Sujata, who offered this milk rice or food uh, to the Buddha who's highly emaciated and starved at the time. <clears throat> and you may see from time to time around Thailand these highly emaciated Buddha images, usually with a beard, and you can see the backbone through the front of the body. Uh, so that these represent the Buddha doing his ascetic practices. It's said that he held his breath for so long that the, whist the wind whistled in through his ears. So. <laughs> uh, so after trying the ascetic practices, he took food again, and then he sat under the Bodhi tree and attained to this thing called, that we now call enlightenment. He called it the Amata. Later on, he called it Nibbana. Uh, he called it uh, a Sankata, the unconditioned. Uh, usually we use the word unconditioned because it points to a state of mind uh, that is not conditioned by any factors. You can't add to it, you can't take away from it, <clears throat> nothing you can do to make it bigger or brighter, there's nothing you can do to attain to it, there's nothing you can do to diminish it. This is the thing that uh, saints and sages throughout the world uh, have been trying to get to. And according to Buddhism, there have been many 
people have attained to this, but they are not necessarily a Buddha. A Buddha is special because he has the charisma, which we'll come to later, uh, to teach and lead other people to the same experience. So most people who hit upon enlightenment, they're finished, they're done, they've nothing left to attain, so they kind of fizzle out or disappear uh, or go on YouTube, one or the other. <clears throat> So after attaining to this thing, he said, you know, people in this world will not understand what it is that I've attained to because it is very abstruse, very hard to see, very difficult to understand. And this generation of people are caught up in lust and desire and are not able to see the stopping of Sankara. Now, what does the word Sankara mean? There is some debates, uh, but here for the moment we'll say Sankara means intentionality. And intentionality means an intention to move by means of the three actions. Action of body, action of speech, or action of mind. Okay? Usually in Western philosophy we have, act, you know, we have body and mind. In Buddhist or Hindu, Indian philosophy, you have three actions, uh, body, speech, or mind. This is why we do the uh, recitation, the bowing is an offering of speech, we do the bowing which is an offering of the body, and we do the meditation which is an offering of the mind. Three kinds of offering when we do a puja. So, how did, he, how did the Buddha himself get to this attainment? I'm going to speed up here. So. Uh, Listen carefully. How did the Buddha attain to this enlightenment? When he sat underneath the Bodhi tree, he remembered a kind of meditation that he had done when he was young. Uh, a kind of uh, mindfulness concentration that he'd spontaneously attained to in, a, in an earlier age, but had kind of forgotten about. Going into this, his mind became very concentrated. And when his mind became very, very concentrated, the legend goes that Mara, the god of delusion, who is a very high god, uh, not like a demon, is a very high god, uh, attacked the Buddha with his armies to try to distract the Buddha from becoming enlightened. So you may take this as being actual, or you may take this as being the forces of delusion in his own mind started to try to disturb him. Uh, as the army threw their weapons at the Buddha, the arrows and the spears, these arrows and spears turned to flowers and fell over him. So the legend goes. I'm telling you this chiefly because uh, A, it's a very beautiful story and the story informs what actually happens. And what actually happens is when you sit and meditate, you get assailed by this confusion, by desires and things like this. So the story informs our action. But also you will see this uh, scene depicted in front of Buddha images throughout central Thailand. Okay? So the wall that the Buddha image faces, you will see the Mara's army attacking the Buddha, the flowers coming down, and then the Buddha is sitting there with one hand on the ground, uh, one hand on the knee, one hand on the ground. And uh, underneath him is a beautiful lady holding her hair. And this is the earth goddess, Dharani. And she's washing her hair because throughout countless lifetimes, every time the Buddha did a good deed, he would pour water on the ground as an offering, which is something we still do today. So she was a witness to how many good deeds the Buddha had done through many lifetimes. So when she's washing her hair, the, you can see on these scenes, the water comes out of her hair and is washing away the demons. So look out for this when you see the, uh, a Buddha image in central Thailand. You'll nearly always see this scene depicted in front of the Buddha. After overcoming uh, the uh, Mara's army, the Buddha had three attainments. The first attainment was the remembrance of past lives. Okay. 
here I was born in such and such a clan, I had such and such a, a work or livelihood, I had such and such uh, clothes, I was male, I was female, I was with these families, I was rich, I was poor. Uh, I ate this kind of food. I always find that funny for some reason, but it's, it's in there in the description. And so he remembered manifold past lives, ten, hundred, a thousand past lives. And through remembering all these past lives, he uh, broke his attachment to this body, this mind, this ego, these thoughts, these views, these opinions, because he realized he's done all of it before. He's been good, he's been bad, he's been everything before. So, break, breaks your attachment to yourself. Second uh, attainment that he made was the seeing the arising and passing away of beings according to their karma in heaven and hell. So, with the psychic vision, he sees beings uh, get born somewhere and he can ask the question, what is the karma that got this being born in this realm? be it a high heavenly realm, or be it a very low realm, you can see, well, all beings are just being propelled by their own karma. And then the last attainment he made was the ending of the asava. The asava means the outflowings of the mind. Now remember just before I said that amata, the deathless, must already be there. You can't add to it, you can't subtract from it, you can't uh, attain to it, you can't change it. Uh, this is the thing that we're trying to attain to. Why don't we see that part of ourselves, according to the Buddha, uh, and all Indian traditions in fact, is because the mind flows out and flows away from its source. Okay? So these asava are called the uh, outflows, or sometimes they're called the floods. And these floods are four in number, uh, sometimes three, sometimes four. Uh, the first one is the asava of um, avicca, of ignorance. Second one is the outflow of sense desires. Third one is the outflow of being, and I'll talk shortly about what being is. And the fourth one, if it's in the list, is the flow of views and opinions. Okay. So once these flows stopped, that was when he attained to enlightenment. This is all according to the legend and the myth. Okay. So, after this attainment, he goes walking along and he thinks, who will I teach? And he decides to teach the, uh, first of all, his former teachers, but they're no longer available. So he goes back to the five ascetics who he used to be traveling around with doing ascetic practices. So when he finds them, they say to him, you know, you're, you're just, you're useless because you took food and anyone who takes food can't have, you know, any attainment. Then the Buddha did something apparently quite interesting. At the time in India, when a doctor would come to your house, the doctor would have a very formalized method of talking to you. He'd have a look at you. And then after he's looked at you, you go and stand in the middle of the room and make a formal declaration. Okay, this is what's wrong with you. This is why you've got this problem. This is how we can, this is the ending of the problem. We have to stop this. And this is the medicine to get to that end or the prescription. So you've got a flu. You got the flu because you went to bed with wet hair. Uh, the getting over the um, flu symptoms of getting past the fever, breaking the fever is the cure. And the way we break your fever is you wear socks and you drink hot water, right? something like that. So it was a very formal declaration that doctors did in this manner. I got this from Alan Watts, so if I'm wrong, blame Alan Watts. Right? <laughs> So the Buddha went up to his disciples, former fellows, and said, Guys, I found it. You know, never before did I say to you, I have found enlightenment, but now I'm telling you, I've actually found what it is. And then he makes this formal declaration. He said, the problem is dukkha. 
or suffering. And dukkha means shaking, instability. He said this dukkha needs to be investigated. Okay? Uh, the cause of this dukkha uh, is desire, tanha. Specifically, three kinds of tanha, three kinds of desire. Uh, desire for sense pleasures, desire for uh, becoming, which is a kind of jhana, deep concentration, meditation. Or desire for annihilation, which is an even deeper form of meditation where you can completely obliterate all sense of yourself. He said all three of these are the cause of your suffering. Uh, this cause should be put away. Then he said the uh, cure of it is cessation. When everything stops, that's when the process, that's when the cure can occur. To make things stop needs to be made real. Satcha, satcha kiriya. Uh, Satchikata bhanti me bhikkhawe, if you know the sutta. Okay? Uh, and then there is a path leading to this cessation, and that path needs to be developed. So these were the Four Noble Truths. Dukkha needs to be investigated. Uh, the arising of Dukkha needs to be put away. The cessation of Dukkha needs to be made real. And the path leading to the cessation needs to be, to cessation needs to be developed. Okay? And this was the Four Noble Truths. Okay? The, what is the path that needs to be developed? Okay. First of all, right view, right intention, uh, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right, con right mindfulness, and right concentration. Okay. I'm going to rattle through these very quick. Right. <clears throat> right view. Most people think right view is my view. And anybody that agrees with me has right view. Anyone who disagrees with me, they've fallen into wrong view and they need to have their view corrected. That's the usual view, that's the usual understanding of right view. When we go back to the source, right view is very specific and rather controversial and rather interesting. We could do a whole session just on this one topic, but I'm just going to rattle through it and leave it with you. Right view is, there is what is given, what is offered, what is sacrificed. There is the fruit and result of making offerings. There is uh, this life, there is the next life. Uh, there are recluses and brahmins who have seen directly for themselves both this life and the next life. That was right view. Basic level. Uh, higher level right view was the Four Noble Truths, which we've just gone through. Okay. So that was right, that's right view. Right intention or right thought, which is the second of the Eightfold Path, is of three kinds. Three kinds of right thought or right intention, three kinds of wrong intention. The wrong intention is sense desire. The right intention is renunciation. Instead of thinking of getting stuff, you start thinking about giving stuff up. Uh, the second one is, the second wrong thought is anger, payabhata, and Thai payabhata. The right kind is non payabhata, non anger, which often we call metta, loving kindness. Okay. The third one is uh, vihingsa, but you may know it as uh, hing, hingsa. Uh, this is what Gandhi called it, hingsa and ahingsa. In the Pali, it's vihingsa, atvihingsa, but it's the same meaning. It means violence or cruelty. So Gandhi picked up on this one phrase and had the non violence um, method of his politicking. Uh, so non violence is the right intention. So right intention is to give things up, non hatred and anger, or metta, loving-kindness, non-violence, which is also compassion, non-violence, non-cruelty, also compassion. Right speech is the next one of the Eightfold Path. 
refrain from telling lies, refrain from harsh speech, speech, refrain from uh, gossip, and refrain from slander. Okay? Right action is the next clause. There are three kinds of right action. To refrain from sexual misconduct, refrain from killing animals, and refrain from stealing. Okay? So right action is not action at all. It's just don't do bad stuff. Right? Now it's interesting, you may note here that we have four of the five precepts, right? <clears throat> First, pre one of the precepts being speech, the other precept being killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct. So, in India at the time, there were only four precepts. The Buddha added in the fifth precept later, which was the Sura Maria, uh, to refrain from drugs and intoxicating substances. So, if you're a Buddhist and you want to drink, you say, I'm following the Eightfold Path, not the Five Precepts, because the drink and drugs is not included in the Eightfold Path. Uh, so probably this is because the Buddha added that extra precept in later. Uh, later on this, uh, or next month, we'll be do I'll be doing the Dharma talks here, and we'll see that Patanjali, when he's giving the Path of Yoga, also only had four precepts, not five. Uh, next up, li right livelihood, to refrain from buying and selling human beings, from buying and selling animals for slaughter. You can buy and sell animals, just not for slaughter. Uh, to refrain from dealing in weapons, to refrain from dealing in poisons. Okay. Uh, right effort was the next one. There are four kinds of right effort. Wholesome, unwholesome states of mind that have arisen, you strive to abandon them. Pahana means to cut off, to destroy them, eliminate, exterminate. Right? It's quite a hard, tough word. Um, unwholesome states that have not arisen, you strive to prevent them from arising. Wholesome states that have not arisen, you strive to arouse them. And wholesome states that have not arisen, you strive to uh, cultivate them or, or spark them, bring them up. Okay? It doesn't say what wholesome states are. The Buddha left that for you to decide what you think wholesome states are. Okay? <clears throat> and to a meditator, you, it's quite clear because a wholesome state is one that starts to center you and ground you and make you stop still. And an unwholesome state is one that starts to agitate and move you and disturb you. <clears throat> and that's why lie detector tests test for stress in your body, because when you're telling a lie, that starts to stress you out. And when you're telling the truth, it starts to calm you down. So these days you have, uh, you can actually buy quite cheap lie detector tests off the internet uh, that you put your hand on. And then they have another lie detector test that detects tremors in your voice. And then you have another one that's based on the webcam that measures your micro expressions. So very soon, very soon, human beings, we are going to be able to tell if somebody else is lying or not. Very easily. Can you imagine how that will change our society? You know? All these guys getting out, oh, I was working so late at the office. <laughs> what about courts? I mean, would courts or the police be able to test you for lies? You know, I'd see if you're telling lies or not. Uh, what about Google Glasses, right? If you Google Glasses, Google Glass, which puts up a little information stream in front of you, what if that, while you're speaking to somebody, it can come up, he's lying? <laughs> This, I think this will really have a, a actually quite a profound effect on our human society when it becomes very easy to tell when someone is lying. So, after right livelihood, we have right, which is, uh, right effort, which are the four kinds. We have right uh, mindfulness. Now, mindfulness here is the word sati, and sati means to recollect. So, it's the right recollection. And this is very important. It's not mindfulness practice that we do normally. That is called 
Sati Sampajanya. If George was here today, he'd be telling you there are many kinds of Sati, not just Sati Sampajanya. So the mindfulness meditation that we do is called Sati Sampajanya, mindfulness with awareness. But just Sati, Sama Sati means the right recollection. Now remember earlier I said there's nothing that you can do to get to enlightenment, you can't add to it, you can't attain to it. And this is why saints and sages have had trouble putting it across to other people. Whereas Samba Sambuddha differs, or one who can teach differs, he's, he's able to say, actually there are certain things that you can do. If you maintain certain perceptions, they will take you towards enlightenment. If you maintain other perceptions, they will take you away from it. So some perceptions are wise, and some perceptions are not wise. So right now, you can pay attention to, uh, for example, your own mortality, that you're going to die. That's one kind of sati, uh, marana sati, recollection of your own death, your own mortality. This is a wise reflection because it orders your way of thinking and starts to prioritize, like, okay, what are the things that I'm wasting time on? You know, TV and movies and silly things and you know, what better ways could I be spending my time? Uh, on the other hand, there are unwise perceptions. For example, you might be thinking about the cricket. And if you are English, you will be very happy, I believe, right now about the cricket. Me too. I'm, cricket is one of the few things that I find even worse than football. But uh, apparently we beat the Australians, so that's something to, to be happy about. So if you're Australian right now and you're thinking about cricket, that's not a very wise perception. <laughs> so there are certain, certain perceptions, and that's what sati means. What do you call into your mind? So samma sati means make sure you're calling the right things into your mind. You're paying attention to the right points. We'll come back to that. The last one is uh, Samma Samadhi, or right concentration. Concentration was four kinds, or four kinds of jhana. Jhana is absorption concentration. So when you concentrate on something very deeply until single-mindedness, your mind will suddenly click and become very blissful, extremely blissful, and very happy. After a while, the bliss will start to go, uh, and the mind becomes very stable and steady, uh, after a while, it just becomes very equanimous. After these four levels of concentration, you then have the four formless kinds of concentration. I told you, you have to pay attention to keep up here. Normally, each one of these things is something that we would do a Dharma talk about on its own. Four formless kinds of concentration, infinite space, and then infinite consciousness. Infinite space is object looking, infinite consciousness is what perceives infinite space, so is subject looking. And usually when you're object looking, things become quite dull, quite dark, quite empty, but when you're watching the observing mind, it becomes very bright uh, and very awake. Uh, then the next two was the uh, neither perception nor non-perception, and then nothingness. So nothingness was the sub subjective perception. All of these together are called the eight jhanas, and the Buddha recommended that people practice these. He had actually practiced these himself long before he became enlightened. So they're not an answer in themselves, but they are a, a part of the path. So that's the Eightfold Path, which is the last of the Four Noble Truths. Okay? Now, why is it that we can't see this enlightenment, or normal beings can't see this enlightenment. Uh, Buddha said, well, your mind is luminous, it's all expansive, all pervasive, but it is covered by extraneous defilements, extraneous defilements, covered by other things. So one analogy for this is like a gem in a bucket of mud, right? 
the gem is still perfectly pure and is untainted by the mud, but the mud is blocking or obscuring the gem. So to get to the gem, you still have to clean away the mud, even though the mud has never affected the gem in any way. So this was the analogy that actually came much later for this uh, enlightenment that we have, but it's covered by muck, by our mud. And these are called the gilesa, or in Thai it's called gilet. And the gilet are ten in number. Okay? First three are called the roots of unwholesome action. Uh, lopa, which is desiring. A different kind of desire to the one mentioned in the Four Noble Truths, by the way. Uh, desiring. Second one is dosa, which is hating. And the third one is moha, which is delusion. These three are usually considered by themselves. Because, <clears throat> I said earlier, the problem is the mind goes outside of itself. <clears throat> Why does the mind go outside of itself? Because it wants things, it wants to get rid of things, or it wants to get absorbed in nonsense. So wanting things, uh, usually you're forward-looking or you're looking into the future or what you want to get. Usually if you're hating or disliking kind, you're looking into the past, looking at what isn't good enough in life. And moha is looking at stuff that, you know, things like TV, the TV is not bad, it's not immoral, it's not, you know, it's not evil in any way, but it's not wise either. Uh, but it is absorbing, so it will suck your attention out. So that's why moha was actually considered worse than greed or hatred. So the first three of the ten kinds of muck that block you from enlightenment, lopa, dosa, moha, greed, hatred and delusion, its usual translation. The next one is mana, which is translated as conceit. Conceit is of three kinds. Also a very interesting point. I am superior to you. I am more advanced than you are. It's the first kind of conceit. You are more advanced than I am is the second conceit. You and I are about the same level is the third kind of conceit. The three kinds of conceit. So you can see you're not supposed to be comparing yourself with other people in any way. Right? Uh, then the next one is ditti or views. And you might remember we had views earlier as one of the outflowings. Uh, views was a, one of the outflowings of the mind. Here views is also considered to be one of the things that obscure your real nature. Uh, next one, vichikicha, which means doubt. Doubting is something that obscures your own real nature. Uh, tina, which is uh, sloth, indolence. It uh, means that you don't want to do it. You're unmotivated. Okay. Udacha, uh, which is restlessness of the mind. Uh, hiriya and anodapa. Apiriya and Anodapa, which is translated as moral shame and moral dread. Moral shame means that if you do something you consider to be unworthy, but you don't care that other people will see you or know that you've done that thing, you don't have a sense of conscience. And moral dread is you don't fear the consequences of doing something immoral. Right? And these days it's called a sociopath. Uh, and a sociopath tends to have no uh, conscience. So they will lie or cheat or do whatever they want to get their aim because they have no sense of, of right and wrong or duty. <clears throat> so these ten things are what obscure enlightenment. What things are worth developing? Another list of ten things. And these are called the parami, paramita. And the parami are the things that the Buddha has practiced to perfection, which is what qualifies him as a Buddha. So if you have practiced these ten causes, it means that you will have a great charisma or influence over other people. Okay? You may know these are the uh, very famous for being the Jataka tales, stories of the Buddha's previous lives. 
There are hundreds and hundreds of stories of the Buddha's previous lives, but the last ten lives are considered very special. So you often see these around in temples and uh, depicted around in the murals on the temples. Okay? And most Thais and certainly all Sri Lankans can tell you in detail these ten stories. Uh, the ten barami then, the ten uh, perfections, which in Mahayana are only six, but in Theravada Buddhism we have ten. First one is dana, giving. There are different kinds of giving, the three kinds, the ten kinds, uh, etc. Um, but in short, giving uh, can be giving of material gifts. Uh, it can be giving of spiritual qualities. Uh, so things like being patient or loving kindness uh, is also a kind of giving. It can be giving of morality. So if you lead a, a moral lifestyle, or if you're a good person, that is also considered a high gift. And then the highest gift that you can make is the gift of doing meditation, which is the purification of the mind. So by purifying the mind, that's the highest gift that you can give to mankind, according to Buddhism. Second one is sila, morality. <clears throat> okay, five precepts, eight precepts. Interestingly, the monks also used to take eight precepts. These days, you probably heard that we have 227 precepts, which is not true. There's over, I don't know, three or four thousand precepts in the, in the Vinaya itself. 227 is just what we recite. Okay. A lot of these precepts, we don't even know what they mean. Some of them don't really, we know what they mean and they still don't mean very much. For example, I'm not allowed to have a needle case for a needle and thread, a needle case made out of bone that is against my precept as a monk. <clears throat> Not a precept I find difficult to keep. Um, another one, you should not sit on a collapsible chair on the second story of a building that has an incomplete floor. <laughs> so make out of that whatever you will. So there are a lot of precepts, we don't even know what they, they really mean. There's another precept that you shouldn't take a in the rainy season, you shouldn't take a bath more than once every two weeks. So, we don't even know what that means. Does that mean you're supposed to stand out in the rain instead of going into a pond? That's one explanation. Was it a specific rule for that group of people in that place at that time for a particular reason? That's another explanation. But suffice to say that the Originally, the monks only followed eight precepts. Yeah. Uh, so, that's the second of the parami, paramita, uh, in Thai, barami. Uh, the third one is nekama, which we had earlier as one of the right thought, and nekama is renunciation. So, thoughts about giving up, letting go, dropping off, leaving be, are more useful than thoughts about getting stuff, having stuff, attaining to things. And this applies to meditation also, because people want to, uh, especially one of our friends who you know well, uh, is always looking for attainments in meditation. And somebody came to me the other day and said that he did this meditation off YouTube, and he had this really amazing experience inside his chest. And then he came to do meditation with me, and he didn't get the experience, and he's wondering if my meditation is no good. Uh, <laughs> he's very frank with it. Um, experiences will come and go. You will have all kinds of experiences in meditation. The important thing is to always be thinking about giving up, dropping, letting go. Uh, and when weird experiences come up, if you latch onto them, that's going to disturb your meditation, not help it. There are, however, certain experiences in meditation that are legitimate, which I'll talk about shortly. So, nekama, to give up, the next parami is banya, or wisdom. Uh, and again, there are three kinds of wisdom. Wisdom that comes from listening to other people. Wisdom that comes from looking into things for yourself. And wisdom that comes from... Uh, meditation from bhavana, from developing a particular quality 
then you have wisdom as to what that quality is. So there are three kinds of wisdom. Then there is uh, virya, right, uh, effort. And we saw this earlier in Vayama, the four kinds of right effort. Wholesome states that have arisen, you, you arouse them, and unwholesome states that have arisen, you let go of. Well, virya is the same kind of concept. It means putting in energy. And sometimes with meditation, if you have too much concentration, everything just kind of stops dead in the water and there's no progress. We say there's no vipassana. So then you need the virya. Uh, virya also means heroic struggle. So if you think, you know, I, I've had my coffee this morning, I have energy, uh, that's not enough. You need to actually have a heroic struggle. Okay. The next Buddha, by the way, is supposed to attain to Buddhahood through heroic struggle. And thereby he will be a greater Buddha than the previous Buddha. He was a Buddha through wisdom. Okay. Part of the legend of Buddhism. Kanti, patience, develop patience. Uh, said that the Buddha once somebody came and chopped off his leg and he thought patience and then they chopped off his other leg and he thought patience and then they chopped off his arms and he thought patience and eventually they chopped off his head and guess what his last thought was as he died? Patience. Okay. So that's how strong your patience has to be. <laughs> I'm a little lacking in that department myself. Um, Next one, satcha, truthfulness. Um, not just truthfulness of speech, but truthfulness of intention, of uh, integrity. Satcha means to be one of uh, very pure intention and integrity. Aditana, resolution. Uh, so that you can make a resolution to do your practices and stick to it. Uh, firmness of the mind. Metta, loving kindness, you need to develop. And the last one, upeka, which is equanimity. So just now we had the ten things that obscure your real nature. These are the ten qualities that you should develop. These are not enlightenment. These will not make you enlightened. But these are ten qualities that will help take you in the right direction. You notice that the ten, the ten kilesa are all things that shake you. Conceit is something that shakes you and disturbs you and blocks you. But these ten parami, parami are things that brighten you and make you more stable. Okay? Um, so, we, uh, then we come to do the practice. And we come then to sit down and we do meditation. And what we find with the meditation is the mind wanders away. Right? You establish the mindfulness with yourself and the mind very quickly wanders away onto other things. Your mind gets lost or caught up in some kind of thinking. Now you're aware of the thinking, but you're not aware that you're thinking. There's a difference. Right? You may be desiring. There's a difference between desiring something and being aware of desiring. When you become aware of the qualities, you don't worry about the object, you just, you're more interested in the quality. So when I walk through Pantit Plaza and I see the new Asus hybrid laptop and I get caught up in desiring, I, I catch myself and I'm like, oh, it's not the computer, it's desiring. So I get interested in that, this disturbance, this shaking, this I want to have it. How much does it cost? How can I get hold of it? What will I use it for? I start to justify, you know, having it. My big one is power tools. Whenever I walk through Klontom and I see power tools, you know, electric drills and sanders, and I saw this beautiful little mini router the other day, and uh, it's six, 4,000 baht, and it was just so beautiful that I, I wanted it so badly. I have no use for it whatsoever, but it's just a beautiful machine. And it has all these beautiful little heads that you can change and that just... So what I'm interested in is that desire, right? That shaking, that... And when I drop it, I'm like, ah, it's just desire. I'm separated from that desire and I can see it for what it is. I can see desire for what it is. So, 
when you're engaged with something, that's called bhava. In Thai is called pop sam. And there are three kinds of bhava. One which is engaged with things that you want, uh, like the disturbances. The other is engaged with the med deep meditation. And the other is engaged with the annihilation meditation, where you just like zzz, just zone everything out. And these three will, these three kinds of becoming will propel you into rebirth. Into after you die, it's that tendency to go outside of yourself and become something that leads to rebirth, according to the program. How does this come about? This is called the arising and the cessation of the world. And I'm going to run through it very quickly. It's also called paticca simupada, or dependent origination, or dependent arising. I call it production. And what happens is the mind is in avicca. Avicca means a method, and the mind doesn't know the method, doesn't know what to do. So it leads into the second clause, which is sankhara, which is the word we heard earlier. The Buddha said, when sankhara stops, you become enlightened. Sankhara are the intentionalities, so the intention to act by body, speech, or mind. When this intention arises and your, your mind flows out, uh, you get consciousness. You become conscious of something somewhere. Okay? And conscious would mean conscious engagement with something. Because you are now conscious of a particular thing, for example, last month when we were here there was some building work going on and they started drilling with a masonry drill just outside and immediately my mind goes to that and that's pulled up into my consciousness but while I was doing the talk because I'm thinking about the talk I'd forgotten all about it so is it there or not there well it's either in my conscious attention or it isn't same as the sound of the air conditioner you've heard it for an hour but you may not have been conscious of it for an hour. So consciousness arises. Consciousness will break, has two aspects, nama and rupa. This is the answer to the question, is the world material or is the world non-material? The materialists and the ideologists in um, philosophy, materialists say everything is just matter, there's nothing else. And the idealists say, no, no, everything is mind, there is nothing else. Well, in Buddhism, it says, well, when something arises in your consciousness, there is always a mind element and there is always a matter element. So if it's the sound of the drill, the matter element is you can hear the sound. That's the physical impingement on your senses. The mental element is uh, of four kinds. You have an intention towards it. You have attention with it. You have a sanya, a perception of what it's about. And you have a Vedana, whether you like it or dislike it. Right? So the sound of the drill comes up. Uh, we have an intentionality to point towards it. We hold our attention on it. We have a perception about it. And then we decide whether we like it or not. So according to Buddhism, there's no such discussion between materialism and idealism. Anything that arises must have both kinds. And they can't be divided. You can't have something purely mental and not physical. And you can't have something purely physical and not mental. Okay. I, have I lost you all? I was hoping I'd lost you but, uh, <laughs> by now. Okay, so because of that name and now the, your attention has gone into this name and form, the mental and the physical, uh, this activates the six senses. So it activates that sense. Your mind is now turned to your ear and is fully engaged with hearing consciousness with that sound that you either like or dislike. So there are six sense engagements. Eye, nose, tongue, ear, body sense. Eye, nose, tongue, hearing, body sense, and thinking. Yeah, taste and hearing and thinking. So maybe a thought that has attracted your attention and your mind gets engaged with the mind sense. This is why in Buddhism, the mind is considered one of the senses. Okay? Because you can sense it. If you couldn't, if mind wasn't a sense, you wouldn't be able to know your thinking. Right? But you can sense thoughts, right? So 
it's got to be a sense, according to Buddhism. Uh, this we then call uh, conscious engagement or pasa, which is contact. Now you're fully engaged with that thing. When you're fully engaged with that thing, you're propelled into a really strong liking or disliking of it. Notice we had liking and disliking earlier, but now it's taken on a much stronger form. Six kinds of liking and disliking. Ear, nose, tongue, hearing, etc. Six senses. Then you have craving. Craving arises. Craving or tanha. Craving in the sense. Sense. You like it, it's like you want to get it, you want to not get it. Uh, craving for the deep concentration of craving, craving for the annihilation. Now that's a little bit abstruse, that's going into the Four Noble Truths. So sometimes the texts say, okay, there are six kinds of craving, craving by the eye, craving by the nose, craving by the tongue, by the hearing, etc. After the craving arises, attachment arises. Okay? And there are four kinds of attachment. Attachment to sense desire, uh, attachment to views and opinions, attachment to rites and rituals, or attachment to a sense of your own self. And it's these, these are four. And when we talk about letting go of attachment, we don't mean you let go of being attached to your children, or your house, or your job, or your retirement, or your health. Those are perfectly natural things to be attached to. Uh, we're talking about the attachment in the mind with this production that starts from avicca, not knowing, and is being propelled or caught up in the world around it. Uh, after the attachment is the bhava, becoming, which we said earlier, there are three kinds, becoming in the sense realms, becoming in the form realms, which is deep concentration, and becoming in the formless realms, which is the annihilation concentration. Okay? Because of these three kinds of becoming, we get caught up in rebirth, and because we're caught in rebirth, we're caught in old age, sickness, and death. Okay? So, this was a process of production. The Buddha called it the arising of the world. Starts just from not knowing what to do, getting engaged or caught up in consciousness, and getting deeper and deeper enmeshed. Uh, the third noble truth, which was cessation, was the unraveling of this process. Okay? If there's no avicca, there's no sankhara, there's no intention, if there's no intention, there's no consciousness, no consciousness, etc. So, what he's pointing to is, in meditation, you can see the world arising by this process and coming up into a problem, into a construct. You can see it unraveling, or unwinding, and then your attention just comes home and it's empty and it's still. Okay, so that's uh, production, Paticca Samupada, and I do intend to do a full, probably six weeks teaching on this at some point, because this is a topic of my thesis, which I've been hard at work on for, for nine years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're nearly done. Um, there are, uh, when we're watching this process of the world arising, the, and the Buddha said, if you see the world arise, you can't deny that it's real. When you've seen the world cease, you can't, be, you can't pretend that it is real. So it's an interesting uh, paradox. So to help us in that, there are certain perceptions that we maintain that stop us from getting involved in this process. First of these perceptions is the perception of impermanence. When you see things as just impermanent and arising and ceasing, you see the whole production behind it. And you see those moments when the mind stops still and doesn't produce the world, doesn't produce all of this stuff. Second one is dukkha. When your mind has got engaged with something, it shakes you, it rattles you. And this is a kind of suffering. It's quite a subtle form of suffering. And the third one is non-self. Anything that you can see, hear, taste, smell, touch, or think about started a minute ago and it will end in a minute. Because nothing stays there for very long. You can't keep a thought for very long without it changing. Or a, you can't look at something, you need sometimes look at the speaker or something and try and hold just your attention on it. Within seconds, you, you can't do it, you can't hold it in the mind. 
So something that's come up and gone, that can't be yourself because you're still here, right? You still have this sense of your own presence. But anything that you find has arisen, has passed away, therefore it's not yourself. So these are the three perceptions. In, uh, impermanence, suffering, and non-self. And again, we would often talk about these for an hour on each of the three subjects. Um, so then, maintaining this sense of the self-awareness without sending it into the world, we maintain this sati sambhajanya, sati recollection, sambhajanya, your own awareness. You're maintaining the sense of your own awareness through four stations. Through being aware of the body, which means while you're aware of the body, you recollect this sense of your own awareness. Uh, through feelings, liking and disliking, or the pushing and pulling of a mind, you maintain this sense of your own awareness. Through different mind states, you maintain the sense of your own awareness. And then through Dharma, and Dharma is all the various bits of Dharma that we've been talking about today, you can hold those in the mind with a sense of your own awareness too. And these will start to generate wisdom. After the uh, maintaining this mindfulness, you abandon the five hindrances. The five hindrances are the things that uh, stop you from becoming concentrated. Uh, abandoning the five hindrances, the mind becomes highly concentrated. When the mind is concentrated and firm and most importantly happy, it is ready to do work. And ready to do work means vipassana. Vipassana originally was a word that was meant for really at the very end of the path. And if ever you see the Tibetan Buddhist path depicted with the monk and the, the, the monk and the monkey and the rabbit, the hare and the elephant, and the monk leads the elephant up the path, you see this at the BIA. Uh, right at the end of the path, the monk drops, the rabbit's gone, the elephant's gone, the monkey's gone, and he gets a sword instead. And that's the sword of vipassana, because that cuts through delusion. So when the mind is perfectly still and concentrated and attained to all these very high states, it's ready for work. And that work is, going back to the beginning, seeing, the, right, seeing your manifold past lives, seeing the arising and passing away of beings in heavens and hells, and seeing the ending of the asava, see the ending of the outflow. At this point, you retain to uh, Jado Vimutti. Jado is the heart, Vimutti is liberation. And it's called Jado Vimutti Jnana Dasana. Jnana is to know, to know directly, not know with understanding, but know directly. Jnana and Dasana means to see. So you see and you know the liberation of the heart. From this attainment, you're still not finished. You're still not the Arahant. <laughs> But, that's as far as the teaching goes. If you've gotten that far, basically you've just got to wait for your karma to come right, and, and then you're enlightened. Okay, so these are um, a number of the teachings that you may have heard before uh, in different ways. You know, we talk about patience, but we don't say how patience fits in. We talk about impermanence, but we don't talk about how it fits in with the overall path. Uh, so this was, in a nutshell, how Theravada Buddhism kind of talked about the entire path, which is a rather complete teaching, right? Um, when you compare to many of the, of the other saints and sages, Ramana Maharshi and I don't know, even Eckhart Tolle and uh, you know, Krishnamurti and people, no one had a really complete, clear set of teachings like that. Uh, and that was why I personally, I, I was uh, attracted to this form of Buddhism. Okay. So if anybody has uh, questions about any of those things, uh, I was going to say talk to me afterwards, but go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Afterwards or now? <laughs>